this time, let's bring up the man who's always on fire with the Holy Spirit and with our keynote, the Holy Spirit of Truth, Father Jack Durkin. Yes, today actually began to feel a little bit like October. Praise God. I was glad that Chris morning got up walking around. It was nice and cool outside. I was liking that so much. Well, here we are today. Um, we're going to be focusing particularly on the spirit of truth, which uh, is actually one of the, the phrases used to describe the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. We actually can penetrate the truth. This is such an advantage in a culture that is confused about all things. And we can actually penetrate the truth. We can't totally comprehend it, but we can be sure we're on the right path to the truth. And that's a great gift because the truth is not something we create. The truth is something that comes to us from God who is the source of that. And we know that, that Christ himself is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. So as we begin today... Um, the truth is we're sinners <laughs> and the most beautiful moment of truth. I think that happens in the world is when Catholics join at mass and they say the confidior uh, over time. I've become more moved by this. I think in the world right now, the one place where truth is introduced is where people say, I'm not going to blame anyone else for my issues. I have sinned and it's my fault. And actually, if we could get our culture to say the confidior, if we could get all of our public leaders to say the confidior, if our culture would entirely change if people said that sincerely. And the whole culture with the church would change if Catholics at the beginning of Mass said that sincerely, that they really meant that. Okay, so these aren't empty words. Uh, but also, when we go to confession, there's another uh, act of contrition, a type of confidior. So let's pray that in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishments. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to sin no more and to avoid the near occasion of sin. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I give you a traditional form of that, which I encourage you to, to memorize, to kneel down at your bed each night and to say that after you examine your conscience. From the heart, you are sorry. That's perfect contrition. Not just because of the punishment that would come if you die in a state of mortal sin, but most of all, because uh, you want to be close to God and he deserves your love and he commands it. So so the idea is in, the, in this prayer is the intention of perfect contrition. And it's very important to intend that. Um, remember, essentially, sorrow for sin is not essentially uh, a feeling. Sorrow for sin is essentially an intention and an act we call this the act of contrition. And what you're saying is, God, I don't want to be separated from you. Okay, this is very important. Um, to not focus so much on the punishments that will be due for sin, um, but to actually focus on the God who will take us beyond uh, all the suffering uh, through death into our heavenly homeland, which is beyond our imagination. Here we go, the truth. Okay, when we focus on truth, the locus of truth is God. And therefore, we want to look and see how is it that our Trinitarian God reveals truth to us. So let's go to the scripture or the catechism to find this. Truth for us concerns conforming our minds to reality. This is our church. We focus on reality. This is why we have an image of the crucifix at the front of the church, because the greatest expression of love in all time and space really is the crucifixion of the son, Jesus both the expression of the greatest malice and the expression of the greatest mercy simultaneous crystallize in this image. And so we are at mass and you're going to see, I'm going to walk you through the mass and say you, the mass is a template of truth. We'll take that, take you through at the end. So truth for us concerns conforming our minds to it's already preceding us. We enter into truth. That's not something we have already. We find this out. We don't make it up. And the world thinks we actually create truth. We do not. 
The Creator gave us truth, and we penetrate truth, discover truth, and live truth. And so we can form our minds to that reality, whether it's visible or invisible, because most of truth you're not seeing right now. Most of the truth you can't see. The visible world is actually passing away, and the invisible world is eternal. Okay, so we believe in truths that are visible or invisible, whether material, you can touch it, ethical, a right or wrong decision, or spiritual. All these aspects of truth we can penetrate as Catholics. We believe in both faith and science, and we know they cannot contradict each other if understood properly. We have a, a great engagement. We're not afraid of engaging truth philosophically, engaging truth scientifically, because we have no fear because we know God's the source of any authentic philosophical and scientific truth. All men are bound to seek the truth, especially in what concerns God and his church. Now, why do we put that first? Because ultimately God is truth. And to seek the truth about God is the most important question of all questions. That is the fundamental question. And the fact that God saves us through the church, which is the body of Christ united to Christ the head, that's also important. And so we need to be engaged in seeking the truth about his church and to embrace it and hold on to it as they come to know it. Not only are we called to know truth, but to live truth, to be bound by truth. And in being bound by truth, we can love in truth. Okay? So that's the first thing. Secondly, the eternal and ultimate reality is the one God in three persons. We find truth in him, and he desires that we find and know and love this truth. The truth is in God. The truth is the Son, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know that truth ultimately is personal, and it's, it's given to us. We can receive it. Secondly, God the Father wills everyone to be saved. We know that. Many times people forget this second part, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look, it's great. You say, I want to be saved by Jesus. What's the truth about Jesus? Is he here now? Is he here body, blood, soul, and divinity? Is he mediated through the church? Yeah, it's nice to say, I want to be saved by Jesus and to actually proclaim this redemption, to proclaim this salvation. However, what are we proclaiming? Okay, because truth is fundamental to faith. Truth is fundamental to Christ himself. What is the truth about Jesus? Is he God or not? Is he fully human or not? We need to know these, right? So Jesus says this in regard to truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. What else? This is before Pilate. What does he say before Pilate says, what is truth? Well, what does Jesus say to him? He says, for this I was born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I can guarantee you that when I decided to become a priest in answer to God's call, why was it? Because of the truth. Where was it written? In Veritatis Splendor. By whom? John Paul II. I read it, and I knew I had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. I had a, you know, the truth is not some abstraction. It's a very concrete reality. And when the truth speaks to you, it says, listen, I need you to become a priest. Okay. It's not like, it's not like this airy stuff. It's something to be excited about, passionate about, to love the truth because the truth is personal. When we fail to love the truth, we fail to love God. When we fail to seek the truth, we fail to seek God. And we have to find that truth first about what is our relationship to God? What is our sin? What is our virtue? What separates us from God? We need to know that because the truth is if I have cancer, I want to know about it so I can be healed of it. If I deny it and pretend like it's not there, I'll die of it. And so this is what we need to know, the truth. What does the truth do? It frees us. Note the importance of the Holy Spirit in regards to truth. When the spirit of truth comes, there we go. He's like the spirit of truth. Why? Because he's the spirit of Christ. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He leads us into Jesus. The Holy Spirit leads us by actual grace into Jesus so that we can live in sanctifying grace. He will glorify me, that's Jesus, the truth, for he will take what is mine, that is the truth, and declare it to you, that is the truth. The spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 
now we have received not the spirit of the world. Who's the spirit of the world? Satan. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God. That is the love of God. That is the truth of God. That is the third person of the Trinity. That we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. God gives us himself to understand himself. God gives us his spirit so that we can penetrate the things of heaven and of earth, to see things on earth from a heavenly perspective, to see from earth things of a heavenly perspective. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the spirit. Have you ever had a discussion with somebody and you're using the same vocabulary and you're not communicating at all? particularly about religious matters, what do you know? We're not speaking in the same spirit. If we're actually speaking in the same spirit, we're going to comprehend spiritual things. If we're speaking in the same spirit, we'll know that's Jesus and that what appears to be bread. We are comprehending in spiritual terms spiritual things that cannot be known outside of the Holy Spirit. That God could be present under the guise of bread cannot be known outside of the Holy Spirit. And you can be assured you're speaking to somebody in the spirit if that person says, yes, that is Jesus. You're speaking about spiritual things in spiritual terms. What's spiritual about that? I can't see the substance. What's spiritual about that? The faith to say it looks like bread, but it's Jesus. Okay? Otherwise, you can't even begin to talk like Thomas Aquinas. Well, how do we know that? We talk about accidents. We talk about substance. We talk about truly, really. You can't even begin to talk about those things if the Spirit's not already said, that is God. If the Spirit hasn't said that, you can't even begin to have a spiritual conversation. And now, sometimes we're trying to have, seriously, before, you got to call on the Holy Spirit to have a conversation about spiritual things. A lot of times, we're leading with Catholic faith, and they're going like, What? You're not speaking in the Spirit. You've been to confession. You can receive sanctifying grace through your baptism. You think, you think if somebody's baptized as a Baptist, they've gone through the life, they haven't committed a mortal sin? Are they speaking in a state of grace? What's the probability of that? Not judging the person, but judging my life. <laughs> Looking at my life, so let, let's say I was baptized as a baptized, Baptist. Let's say I was 15 years old. Am I really in a state of grace? Can I have a really a practical conversation if that person is not in a state of grace? You cannot. Should you be seeking to have a conversation? Yes, but you should be calling down what? Actual grace of the Holy Spirit so that despite the blindness of the person, they begin to see. And sometimes they have to physically blind people for them to see, such as in the case of Saul. So we need to know what's happening. Why is it we're not communicating? A lot of times somebody is not in a state of grace and they don't know anything that you're talking about because spiritual things are discerned not by your power, not by your wisdom, not by your incredible mind, but perceived by God who's dwelling in you so that you can penetrate that reality. This is what is revealed in Scripture, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Jesus is crucified. Jesus breathes out His Spirit. What is wisdom? The wisdom is the cross. What is wisdom? That is the plus sign of all eternity and all time and space. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the spirit. Yes, that's a wonderful thing. You know when you're communicating and when you're not. It's such a beautiful thing when actually you're you're like speaking to a seven-year-old child and they understand the blessed sacrament and you realize the spirit's loving you two together. It's It's so great. And it's so sad to meet somebody like 35 who has a college education. You're not communicating. No, seriously, there's no communication. I mean, you talk about football, you talk about you talk about poly, you can talk about anything, but there's no communication going on. It is deadly. Seriously, by the end of it, you feel like I'm ready, I'm just bury me now. No, I'm serious. You're talking to somebody, this person is intelligent, this person and this person is so far away from God, and it's so sad. And I know I'm not that close to God, but seriously, look at this. This is so sad because they're not even seeking God. That's what's so tragic. To know that, gosh, I'm still seeking God, I'm still imperfect, but this person has no idea that they're, they're thinking they're going to be happy outside of God. We're having conversations about thinking they're going to be happy if they just pay off their college debt, thinking they'll be happy if they just own this house, thinking they'll be happy if they just have this nice meal, and missing the whole point of anything and everything. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about, right? Isn't that a frustration? Well, that's a holy desire, what I want us to speak together in the love and truth of the Holy Spirit. That's how I want to speak. I want to have a real conversation, have a real connection, right? 
So this is what we're talking about. Now, sin and ignorance and error, what do we find here? Error distorts, twists, or destroys truth. Satan, what is he? A liar and a father of lies. This is the way Jesus describes him. This is basically what he does. He parses up truth. He gives you little portions of what is not true because it's out of perspective. It's warped. Those who lie and fail to live according to the truth are Satan's children. That's why we have baptism. When the child comes in, we, we take the child out from underneath the dominion of Satan and bring them into the body of Christ, our deliverer. So we do, okay? That's why we have an exorcism at the beginning of a baptism. We live in truth by conforming our minds and will to reality. The proper use of the intellect, right reason, is directed towards what? Truth about the laws of nature, material science, fundamental truths underlying all reality, natural law, philosophy, and metaphysics, uh, principles and axioms necessary to draw true conclusions. We need to know the principle of non-contradiction. You can't have things that are contradictory be true at the same time. Okay, these are fundamental things that we embrace. Okay, we, we embrace reality. Secondly, uh, moral laws that help us discern right from wrong, good from evil. We believe this is placed in all of us. We call that natural law in our hearts, but it's distorted by sin. We have natural law in our hearts, but we also tend to rationalize our sins because of fear, because of, of pleasure, because of whatever. Yes, we know right from wrong. We have a conscience, but it's buried under all this distortion. Okay? Theology, what is that? Faith seeking understanding. We believe in material science. We believe in philosophy and metaphysics. We believe in theology. All of these we believe in. They're all truth and they all come from God. So here we go. It's accepted. What do we do? The doctrine to which we assent, we believe, I believe, one sacred deposit of faith. That's the key. When, you know, when we're trying to talk with our Protestant brothers and sisters and we begin to look at Scripture, what's the problem? The problem is the, the Scripture was misinterpreted when Jesus came. Trying to interpret Scripture alone just doesn't work. And you can argue all you want to, and they just say, well, I interpret it this way, you interpret it that way. Really, what do we have to say is you can't know the deposit of faith unless you have these three things. So what are these three things? Accepted by the apostles and passed on through the bishops. That's the magisterium. Essentially, lived experience and practice of the faith. Over more than 2,000 years, there is this continuity of tradition, of celebrating Mass, of living the sacramental life, of praying in certain ways. It's written, inspired word of God is given to us and interpreted by the church. The church gave us the Bible and interprets it. So magisterium, scripture, tradition, all those have to be woven together to get verification of what we actually believe in the positive faith. Okay, and, and the sense of the faithful lifts that up, but you have to work because you have to be seeking truth and living truth. And once you do that, you can discern truth better and better over time. It's not done alone. It's done communally. Here we go. Formation of truth, pat, present, past, and future. The truth about God. Okay, now here's Mass. Think about Mass as nothing but truth. What is the beginning of Mass? We make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's the truth? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The truth about sin, suffering, and death in a fallen world. You make the sign of the cross. That's the truth. I'm a sinner. I needed a redeemer. The second person of the Trinity took flesh and died on that cross. All of that summed up in the sign of the cross. And there you confess your sin. Secondly, the truth about mercy, grace, and redemption. However, after we say, I confess, and so forth, we just don't walk around with Catholic guilt. What we say after that is, uh, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And then what do we say? Glory to God in the highest. You've given that mercy. The truth about our sin, but the truth about redemption and grace. What's the next thing we do? The truth as good news and God's revelation. Scripture, homily, creed all nailing down the truth that God has professed to us and given to us verbally and in written form. Then, of course, the truth about communicating with God. Hey, this God we actually can talk to. He's personal. We're going to lift up some petitions right now. We're going to pray to him, and he's going to answer our prayers, petitions, and the Eucharistic prayer. I'm praying to God the Father. He actually answers my prayer. He sends his son again and again for us to receive him in the Blessed Sacrament. The truth about Christ's presence with us until the end of time. He's in the Eucharist. 
The truth about Holy Communion on earth and in heaven. When we receive Holy Communion with nine of the angels and saints in heaven, they're united with us on earth here. This is the truth. And then, of course, the truth about the responsibility of taking this out on mission. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Have you ever thought about Mass that way? I'll tell you, go to Mass, meditate on this. You go like, wait a minute, this is like a truth factory. This is like truth all over the place. This is nailing down truth. I mean, seriously, we're naming it, and we have gotten so used to things, we don't compress it and say, what does that mean? Wait a minute, the sign of the cross, when people say, why do you make the sign of the cross? It sums up everything you need to know. That's why we make the sign of the cross. If you but knew the wisdom of that cross, if I but knew the wisdom of the cross, right? We don't do these things arbitrarily, and that's why we should do them reverently, because this is the redeeming truth who is Jesus that sets us free to love in the name of God. That's what this is. It's saying zero, black, white, flashing. Get off the stage. It's saying to Father Jack, this, I don't listen to technology. You say what you want to. I don't even listen. No, I will actually will get off the stage. Here we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, I think there's some Holy Spirit going on in here with that one in particular today. Somebody is definitely on fire. Um, this is the time we call Table Talk. So we are going to have the ability to kind of talk through some of the a question that Father Jack has posed for us, but some of the things that he's talked about for us today. Um, so we're going to pull that up right now. And what we ask is as you talk about this question at your table, you give everybody an opportunity to share if they feel like they're comfortable to do so. We just want to allow um, everyone to grow in their faith. So if we make room for everyone to speak at this point, that'd be fantastic. So let's look at the questions. What do you see as the most destructive denial of reality and truth in our culture? And how must we in our church and in our families live and promote this reality and truth? And what must we do to promote this reality and truth in the culture at large? So we're going to put five minutes on the clock and allow you to talk right now about that. Lock in on your answers. We're going to go through this here. Um, some of these are meant a little bit tongue-in-cheek, so, you know, but. Okay, so here we go. Number one, we're going to start answering these. Number one, uh, Catholics understand faith to be blind and exclusively concerned with the heart, not the mind. True or false? False. So, we want the mind and the heart to operate together, not exclusively the mind, not exclusively the heart. But if you think about this, the eyes of the heart to be able to see. Think about this. Uh, I love Ratzinger has this statement that uh, love enables us to see more. We can see truth without love, but with love, it becomes expansive. And you know that, too. If you actually meditate on the word of God with love for Jesus it opens up a whole wide expanse of things you never imagined or thought about, okay? So love always expands vision, and uh, hatred always shrinks it. And you find this, whenever, whenever somebody's a hater, uh, what happens is they get narrowly focused on certain things, they just grind it out. They got enemies, so they got this or that. So you find that hate typically uh, narrows a perspective a whole lot, okay? Fear and hate are very narrowing in terms of the ability to see. Why? Because you don't have the freedom. You're actually enslaved by what you hate. And when you love, you love freely. Okay? And, and love is the power you have that cannot be taken away even by your enemy. That's the great power of it. Okay? 
Because think about this, that is what Jesus has revealed to us. You must remain free, and to be free you have to love, because I freely loved you, you freely love me. So hate always distorts. And you'll notice that when you've hated, you've gotten narrowed down into just you and that person you hate. That's what we call a preparation for hell. Okay, I mean, you're, you're not moving in freedom. Because you have to be free. Because think about this. Have you ever noticed that when you're really disturbed by somebody or what they said or something, what happens is you're moving on and then you think about it. Oh, gosh. And you keep thinking. About it. You're enslaved by that. You keep going back to it. And you can't get away from it. And you realize you're not free. I, I was, there was something I had heard recently that just had disturbed me very much. And I was praying myself. I had to pray myself out of it. Say, Lord, I'm bound by this misperception of this person. I got you got to free me from this. I, I can't be thinking about this person because they're not just the sum of this one misperception they have about me. OK, I need to be free of that situation. I need to love the person. And I have lots of other people to love, lots of other responsibilities to fulfill. So Catholics understand that. All right. We we have faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, but it's not blind. Okay, They're, you're still seeing something when you walk by faith. Uh, when you walk up to receive the blessed sacrament, you're still seeing the accidents of bread, and you say that's God, but you're seeing, but you're not seeing in uh, physical terms. Okay, we make a distinction between uh, faith vision and material vision. They're not in contradiction. But they're not exactly the same. That's why we wouldn't have beatific vision unless we die and rise to heaven. And then we're able to see what we can't see now, right? What is invisible becomes visible to us. We know for certain that what the Bible reveals about creation contradicts what science has proven. So we see that authentic faith and true science may necessarily contradict one another at times. Is that true or false? So like people, you know, we're not, uh, we're not uh, literalists. We believe in what is literal, but not what's literalistic. And what that means is we don't read uh, the book of Genesis as if that's a scientific account of the creation of the world. Okay? We actually read it as an account given to a particular writer that needed to know what we need to know as a template for the beginning of the world. What do we need to know? We need to know that God created us holy. What do we need to know? We need we fell in sin. What do we need? I mean, there's lots of things that we need to know that we couldn't see that somebody's writing about. So we don't see that as history as we understand it. We don't see it as science as we understand it now, but we see it as truth. Okay? And, and I call it, what I call it is iconic truth. What the book of Genesis tells us is so necessary. I mean, like you can't understand reality unless you understand the fall. It tells us what is so fundamentally necessary that you can apply to what the problem is and the solution of the redemption is all related to that book of Genesis. If we didn't have the temple of Genesis, we wouldn't understand the iconic crucifixion of Christ. We wouldn't understand any of it, you see? And so I think it's important for us to say, you know, this is truth. But it's not truth as we uh, corner truth, you know? Okay, so there you go. Number three, uh, God is the source of supernatural truth, whereas man is the source of natural truth, true or false. All source of truth is God. Now, our world's telling us uh, supernat what they say is God's source is supernatural truth, and he's so you can't know it, so it just evaporates. <laughs> We're the source of all truth. And that's what it is. We've leveled everything now to us as individuals as sources of truth. Number four, according to the Catechism, the church teaches that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, can be known with certainty from His works by the natural light of human reason. Is that true or false? That's true. We can know that there is a God... But what we cannot know is that there is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There, by right reason, I can obviously use logic to deduce that there has to be a God. But the actual detailed features of that God are revealed by God himself through his son, Jesus, and in other ways. All divine revelation is found exclusively in Scripture, which provides the authoritative rule and standard of faith. That true or false? False, Okay. So the church is the authoritative standard and rule of faith, the deposit of faith itself. Okay, so we don't, uh, Scripture uh, outside of magisterium, um, Scripture outside of tradition can be interpreted in as many ways as you have many denominations, okay? Number six, Catholics affirm that authentic freedom and love require that I construct my own truth that others must accept, even if my truth contradicts theirs, true or false? Okay, this is the world right now. Um, when they say now marriage can be whatever we want to name it, same-sex marriage is love. 
and therefore you have to accept this. You see what I'm saying? We go, oh, no, there's true love, and there's love that's not true, okay? We don't construct what is authentic and what is not. And then number seven, scientific truths can be known with certainty, whereas religious truths cannot. What's that? False again, okay? So there you go. We say we can certainly know about God. We can certainly know this is our confidence. If we give ourselves in faith to what we can know, we will grow in knowledge and wisdom and the truth will set us free and we'll have great. Because if you think about it, the church herself throughout the centuries has never been afraid of any type of authentic knowledge. The church has given us hospitals. The church has given us science. We make distinctions between what is actually spiritual, what is material. If somebody, for example, an exorcism is the most scientific thing you could ever imagine. You, you bracket out, does this person have psychological issues? Are they on medication? You bracket, you have all these scientific questions that have to do with material and psychological reality. Then you address the spiritual possibility and reality that could be there. Okay, so we always apply science. miracles. We use science to verify miracles. Okay, to have a verifiable miracle, what do we have to say? There is no scientific or medical explanation for why this person got healed. We use science to verify a miracle. You see what I'm saying? Like people, when we look at a church, like, oh, you people just go believe everything. No, I do not. I don't believe everything. I don't say, you know, this looks like an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on this piece of toast. That must be a miracle. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you see those on the internet. It's like, well, yeah, could be, I, but I don't believe so. I don't think it's scientifically verifiable. Okay, there you go. So here we go. Mission. Again, morning prayer, renewal, baptismal promises, angel of God, glory be. Why do we do that renewal, baptismal promises in the morning? Because we renew our life in Christ. We're born again in the morning. We rise with the sun again, okay? At night is like preparing for death. When, when you go to sleep at night, the darkness descends on you. You should say, I'm ready. I've said my act of contrition. I told God I'm sorry. In the morning, you rise to live as a child of God again and again. Uh, mental prayer, why? If you're not uh, in mental prayer during the day, you're not drawing close to God, and you're not in communication with Him. What do we need to do? What's the hardest thing to do? Slow down and get silent. There are two fundamental things. When you read any, if you read uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, if you read Cardinal Seurat, if you read any of them, what are they saying? We need to slow down and we need to listen. And we need to listen from the heart of the church. Now, I see mothers out there. I see fathers out there. How you slow down and listen, I don't know how that's going to happen. But what should you be demanding of your priests? Father, I demand that you slow down and listen because I can't. Okay. When you come for me for counseling because you haven't slowed down and listened for like a year or two through no fault of your own, what do you need from me? What I've observed and what I've done when I slow down and listen, right? You're expecting me to go to that well on a daily basis. That is my job. My job is to slow down and listen and speak prophetically. Okay, because hey, what I find a lot of times is when I counsel a married person, what I'm doing is I'm listening to them and then I just tell them what they know already. Almost every time that they come in, they go like, I know that. Well, good. We were quiet. We prayed a little bit together. And now you can remember that. And I go back in with that knowledge. Does that make sense? So this, it's not like rocket science or anything. It's like what well, people know already. Or there's just a little tweak. I just said, you're calling this. Uh, I was having a, a beautiful counseling sense the other day, and, and the Spirit said to me, what this person uh, is calling fear is actually suffering. And just change that word. So I changed that word, and the person said, oh, I see. <laughs> I, every time I begin to suffer, I think uh, that I should be running away from this. I go, oh, no, this is for you to embrace in your memory. And the person, things were coming up in this person's memory, that were persons, and it was very sad to them. I said, oh, no, that's just suffering sadness. Look at that with God. Um, and the fear you're having is you're afraid that these things are just taking over. I said, no, no, God, I was actually reminding you now because you're ready to look at what you couldn't look at before. And then it's like, it, but it's very simple. Why couldn't the person see that? Because uh, that person's so busy, and it's not through any fault. And if I can just step back and be slow with them for a while, they see simply, oh, that. What, what do they know? I've changed one word, and it's truth. 
And what's very likely happening there, the devil's trying to get them to misidentify fear and suffering. And it's a very common thing for us as Christians to do, to, to actually say something's a fear that's actually just suffering, okay? And that, we, that we, we can love our way through it, okay? So there you go. Examination of conscience. Then I call upon the Holy Spirit. And my guardian angel to help me see the truth about both my goodness and virtues and my sinfulness and vices. We need to know both of those. That's knowledge. Secondly, did I cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit to grow in virtue and overcome vice? And did I cooperate with the movements and actions of the Holy Spirit to speak in truth to others, motivated by love for them, especially as regards my family and with those whom I frequently associate? Very often, we are attempting to speak truth with us without love, and therefore it's not true. Okay. It, truth is actually uh, an abuse upon somebody because it's too partial when it doesn't have love in it. Okay. And it, it turns into a splinter. Uh, did I ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit in my conscience and lie, cheat, and steal? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I hope not. Let's stand, please. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This month of October, tomorrow, is Our Lady of Victory, Our Lady of the Rosary. She is crushing the head of the serpent uh, by the power of her son, Jesus and so we pray for her intercession to carry out the victory in our own lives as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Next week, we are not meeting next week, but the week after that we will. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord.